I'll be honest, I've never been a massive fan of head units in general, specifically modern ones. I feel like as head units have become more and more feature rich, they've become more complicated to use and therefore the likelihood of encountering issues with them is more common and the more focus required to your head unit is less focus on the road. Now head units used to just simply be a selection of buttons and knobs for you to control the source and the volume of your music as you were driving, similar to the um, fan or the air conditioning controls on your car, simply setting uh, fan speed or temperature and it could easily be done with very little dis distraction from the road while you're driving. However now, not only aftermarket head units but also factory integrated entertainment systems require so much of your attention, mostly by the use of touch screens therefore not giving you any tactile feedback as to where the buttons are or what buttons you're pressing and updating it with each press to a different screen requiring again you to take your eyes off the road and actually look at what you're going to be pressing. This is why for the most part in my vehicles I have not actually deviated from a very classic head unit style setup and when I have needed any additional features that a old fashioned style head unit can't provide such as satellite navigation or such as high resolution audio streaming I will use a device which is the most responsive and that I'm the most accustomed to, which would be my mobile phone. I never condone using your phone whilst driving for any ongoing tasks. However, using a phone instead of using a touchscreen head unit, I see them as similar enough. If one of them gets the job done better, then I don't see any different as adjusting the controls on your car. As time has gone on and computing power has become smaller and cheaper, we've started to see Android powered head units pop up on the market. And I've got one here that I want to kind of go through and tell you a little bit about the things I feel about it. Now, Etoto did send this to me for free. However, I made it very clear to them in the email exchanges that I had that I am not generally a fan of Android head units and this would be a completely impartial overview of their device and it would highly likely not be particularly favorable of their device. But I would keep an open mind while looking at this. Now you're not here on my channel because you want to see some generic review of this device, unboxing, looking at all the accessories and the features this has. There's countless other YouTube videos on that that go through those details. You're here because you have a technical mind like myself and you'll be interested in more technical tests of this device, how much power it actually bench tests, for example. And because this is Android, seeing if there are any workarounds we can use to get a better experience for a high quality SQ audio system with this in place. We're going to be focusing on the audio quality of this, whether it's any good, and the options and settings that we get for calibrating a nice sounding setup. The first thing I noticed was loudness is on by default from factory. So just remember to turn that off. The second thing I noticed is that the sound field is predetermined for the driver to be on the left, which is fine for most of the world, but no good for me. Fortunately, I can change the steering wheel position to right, so that's cool. However, although that changes the sound field driver position to the correct side for me in the UK, the default time correction by this comes preloaded with default time correction parameters, which I'm not a massive fan of. I think it should be off by default because for me, if I was completely unaware of this and installing this into the car and I'm sitting with the driver's side on the right hand side, these time alignments are kind of rough guides for an optimal listening position on the left. So the passenger would get the best sound despite me putting this sound field to the driver's side. So that is a bug that needs to be corrected. It either needs to be updated and mirrored when you select different uh, positions for the sound field or it just needs to come off from factory and the default settings all need to be at zero. We're going to be testing the legitimacy of all of these controls and the EQ on the oscilloscope in a bit so stay tuned. Stereo enhancer you're going to want to leave that off, bass boost you're going to want to leave that off. We have crossover settings for front, rear and the sub seems to be missing from this screen. We can set a high pass filter on the front and the rear, which is useful for taking the bass out of door speakers. It will make them sound so much better and get louder without flapping around and distorting on the lower frequencies that the sub should be handling. But the low pass filter is a bit confusing. Um, we start at 20 kilohertz and we can actually decrease that all the way down to three kilohertz. Now this baffles me a little bit. I can't think of any scenario where you'd want to low pass filter the speakers that are attached to the head unit. Having a low pass filter doesn't really seem to make any sense and it's not designed for subs either it's not like you can use this for having subs on the rear channels or anything like that because it only goes up to three kilohertz here so no idea why that's here i'd rather they got rid of that and instead gave a low pass filter for the sub channel 
Talking about sub, there is an RCA output here for the subwoofer, which is fine, but I can't seem to find any direct controls for this on the head unit at the moment. But the one thing which baffled me the most is there is no RCA output for front and rear. Well, that's already completely thrown out of the water one of the good use cases I could think for an Android head unit. So as it is, you're limited to using this head unit to drive your door speakers directly with no line level output. But, but it's clear that Itoto have actually thought about this because they include in the box these line level converters. So they're saying in order to get RC output, you just need to run line level converters off of the speaker outputs. There is clearly a preamplifier circuit in here capable of producing line level output for the audio signal by the fact that we've got a subwoofer output. Why not simply include low level front and rear? There's even a spare freaking unused connectors on the back here, which in the manual say are unused. Anyway, let's do some technical tests. How much power does this bench? It says an audio feast with four times 24 watts RMS on the amplifier side. So let's see if that's actually true. Now, unlike normal amplifiers, head units actually take the 12 to 14 volts battery supply voltage and use it as the rails for the amplifier side. So unless a head unit specifically has a DC to DC converter, like a switching power supply inside of it, the power that head units can do is limited by the vehicle's charging system. And since like 99.9 99% of vehicles run on 12 to 14 volts. That means that pretty much all head units are going to do similar power. You can see we've got our sine wave with our two voltage rails and the car provides zero volts down here at the bottom and between 12 and 14 volts. We're going to take 14.4 as that's a pretty common value for the maximum normal charging voltage of a vehicle. So 14.4 volts is naturally a very low rail voltage to drive a speaker. So head units also run the amplifier stage in full bridge push pull to essentially double the voltage across each speaker. So let's do a theoretical calculation then of how much power head units will be able to produce not taking into account Count any efficiency or trace losses or voltage sag or anything like that. So to calculate the RMS voltage of the sine wave coming out of each channel, we take the peak to peak voltage, which is going to be 14.4 volts. Calculate that and we pretty much get a 5 volt RMS sine wave on each of the positive and negative terminals of this head unit output side. Now since each channel is in full bridge or push pull, we double the RMS voltage, which means that each speaker has a maximum of 10.2 volts to it before clipping with a 14.4 volt supply to the head unit. And giving that into a regular 4 ohm speaker will give you an absolute maximum of 26 watts RMS in an absolutely ideal scenario. I believe there have been some brands that have made head units with DC to DC power supplies built in to give them some higher voltage rails similar to an amplifier to therefore allow the head unit to provide more power to the, the speakers. But unless the head unit specifically says that it's doing this and as is like a it's like a prominent selling feature of it, if it states four times 50 watts max then it's going to be absolutely at most about 25 26 watts rms per channel and especially with older head units a lot of those won't actually run in push pull or full bridge topology so therefore the power was halved again to about 12 and a half watts per channel so i've got 14.4 volts going in and since this is a full range power test i'm going to be testing it with a thousand hertz usually i test with about 50 hertz for subwoofer amplifiers but we're going to go in for a thousand hertz as this is full range so i have four channels here on the oscilloscope connected to each of the four channels of the head unit and i have a four ohm resistive dummy load connected to each of the channels now as i increase the audio signal here you can see it start appearing on the scope and the fact that you can only see one waveform here means that all four channels are perfectly aligned in phase and as you can see the audio wave is also riding along some dc See, this down here is zero volts ground and that's because like i said this head unit uses the 14.4 volts as rail therefore the midpoint that the audio wave oscillates around is a generated floating midpoint so we've got zero volts down there this generated floating midpoint and then the 14.4 volts up here somewhere so provided everything is perfect we should start to see the audio wave clip when it touches zero which is the limit of the negative rail but it might start clipping a bit earlier at the top of the sine wave as the current draw sags those rails down. In order to accurately read the VRMS on each channel at clip point, we need to actually put the scope into AC coupling because at the moment, as you can see, with barely any signal playing, the scope's actually reading 7.2 volts. And that's because there is some DC offset because we're in DC coupling mode, which is obviously gonna skew our results when we're measuring the sine wave. So we need to throw it into AC coupling mode. And because of my oscilloscope limitations, I can only do this for channels one and two. I can't couple three and four to AC. So we're gonna leave channels three and four on, just make sure they don't clip any 
any earlier than the rest of them, but we're only going to be looking at channels 1 and 2 for the VRMS reading as they're AC coupled. So let's turn this up and hopefully nothing goes pop. Okay, there's our clip point. Just bang on clipping there. You can see that as we do start to turn it up, there is some slight variance in the channels, but we'll talk about that later. I'll check all of the channel variants in a bit. But right now we're just looking for output power. So channel one, just below clipping, was a 3.924 volt RMS sine wave, and on channel two is a 3.965. So pretty much almost identical. There might be some slight probe tolerance differences between those. It does possibly look like the channel three or four had a bit of more clipping going on than the others. Um, but yeah, we'll look at that in a little bit later. So because each channel's in push-pull, I do need to go ahead and double that VRMS. And we're gonna take the 3.965, double that, to give us 7.93 volts was just a clipping point there on these channels. So you can see based on our theoretical maximum of 10.2 volts, it is a little bit less and that will likely be due to the sagging rail voltage inside. So let's put 7.93 in here into a four ohm resistive load and that gives us, whoa, that is a lot less power than claimed based on percentage wise. So this is with all four channels loaded. Now on the channel page, it does say four times 24 watts, but it doesn't specify whether that is with all channels loaded or with just one channel tested. So now let's unhook three of the four dummy loads and see whether bench testing one channel gives us any higher power. Okay, now I've just got one of the channels hooked up to a dummy load. All the other three are completely open. On the oscilloscope now, we're observing both push and pull halves of this channel. So observing the full bridge. So let's see if this clips any higher. Okay, there we go, a little bit of soft clip, and we have 4.254 and 4.307. So let's go for 4.3, that's obviously a bit higher. So 4.3 times two gives us 8.6, 8.6 into a four ohm load. 18.49 watts. So that is still a fair percentage away from its claim, which is a shame because that is now just false advertising. It can't do 24 watts into one channel loaded or four channels loaded. So this needs to be updated. I suspect that that is purely theoretical based on no actual current induced voltage drop across the units. Possibly instead of 14.4, they simply used 14 volts in this theoretical ca calculation, which gives us 14.9 volts. And when we full bridge that, we get 9.899. So when we put that into the calculation, we actually get pretty much bang on 24. So yes, I suspect that this rating has been made purely theoretical with a 14 volt supply to the head unit. Naughty, naughty. Okay, now let's see whether there's any variance in the output level of these four channels. I've got everything set to center and all the levels, etc., on the head unit set to complete default and central levels. Again, we're gonna play a one kilohertz test tone. And as you can see here, clipping point does actually allow it to go all the way down to zero volts if there wasn't any voltage sag of the rail under current load. But let's set this to AC coupling and let's set a nice easy to view VRMS reading that is under clipping. 4.5 pretty much bang on the nose there, 4.49, 4.5 volts RMS and that is on channel one. So now if I move it over to channel two, let's see whether there's any deviance. 4.59, so it's, it's basically 4.6. So we've got a 0.1 volt RMS difference between the first channel and the second channel. Channel three is somewhere in between, 4.53. So somewhere in between channel one and two. And lastly, channel four, we have 4.6 again. So the white and gray wires are 4.5-ish and the purple and green wires are 4.6-ish. The 0.1 volt deviance is between front and rear channels. That's a lot better than if it was between left and right. So that is pretty much a negligible difference. Okay, let's have a look at the audio settings and make sure they work as intended. I'm gonna start looking at time correction. I'm probing both front channels, front, right, and front, left. And as you can see on the scope screen here, we have a perfectly overlapping sine wave. Looks beautiful, those channels are perfectly in phase. So as we turn on the time correction, does this work as intended with no glitching or weird artifacts? And what should happen is as I start increasing this dial, we should see the phase of the second channel start shifting. So these waveforms should start overlapping each other slightly yeah that's working beautifully now we're on the rear channels and again that's working as intended nice 
Okay, let's have a quick peek at the EQ and make sure that it's doing as it says. So I'm going to increase 24 up to just below clipping there. And you can see we have a Q value here as well, which we can change. And that's really interesting. That changes the width of frequencies that this EQ boost or cut affects. So at the moment, you can see this is affecting 24 and we're playing 24. Let's now increase the frequency and let's play something higher until it starts to drop off. We're completely out of the bump by the time we get to 35 hertz. So let's play 35 hertz. And as I decrease this Q, that bump of 24 should start affecting R30. 35 hertz we're playing yeah it's starting to affect it by the time we get all down to 0.7 we have now much higher amplitude on the 35 hertz cool that's working as intended with a completely flat eq check make sure that the frequency response is nice and flat across the board without any ups or downs so let's calibrate the output to be on these lines so that is a four volt peak uh, 8 volt peak to peak with a 2.7 volt RMS sine wave. Let's just calibrate that. 2. Point, let's go for 2.8. So bang on those lines. So I'm going to start increasing the audio signal now and hopefully it doesn't change in amplitude at all as we go. Okay, so it's increased a little bit from 17, but that's to be expected, you know, high pass filter and all that. So by the time we go from 17 all the way up to 100, we have increased in signal a little bit. Okay, so no problem. There's a very, very tiny amount of roll off on the low frequency. We're up at 3.1 volts now. Let's keep going. Still about 3.1 volts, nice. Up at 3.3 now, so we've gone up a little bit on the higher frequencies there at about nine kilohertz. So there, there is actually an increase there from about two kilohertz to nine kilohertz. There is a bit of a increase there. And you can see the channels are actually starting to deviate a touch from each other. There's another boost again at 20 kilohertz, so I've got 3.5 volts now. Anything above 20 though is heavily, heavily low passed with quite a bit of noise there actually. This is just playing now 23 kilohertz. It's actively trying to reduce that amplitude there above 20. So although this won't be audible to many people, if you can hear stuff up to 20 kilohertz or slightly beyond, or if you believe that the frequencies above 20 hertz, although cannot be heard, do affect the audio, the audio experience, that might be something to bear in mind. It's going to sound a little bit weird up there. Gonna have a quick look at the high pass and the low pass filter. So I'm playing a uh, 30, 40 hertz test tone right now. So as I start increasing the high pass filter, we should see that start to reduce and it should be at roughly the right sort of frequency. So this is set to 20. If we go up, we go to 40. So by 40 hertz, we've lost a little bit of the output but not a huge amount so i would say if you want it to start really cutting frequencies to your door speakers at a specific point you need to go much higher than you think so in order for me to really get rid of 40 hertz from my door speakers i would need to set the high pass filter at about 90 hertz so the the roll off is quite shallow here for the high pass filter but that does appear to be working as intended. And let's just check that there isn't any weird um, harmonic distortions going on on the waveform during the high passing. Okay, as you can see, the frequencies that are being filtered are heavily distorted. So applying the high pass filter, it will reduce the level of audio signal at those frequencies going to the drivers. However, during that crossover slope, the audio wave is quite considerably misshapen. Let's do the same again with the low pass filter, which again, I'm not sure why you'd really use, but anyway, um, we're playing a 13.4 kilohertz test tone. So as I decrease this from 20K, we should start to see that drop off as we come to, you know, around about the right kind of area. Here we go. So it starts visibly reducing on the scope screen when we get to about 16K. And in order to get rid of most of that energy, we need to go up to about 8.7k um, now is that distorting the audio waveform not visibly not like it was on the low frequency stuff as much i don't think no it still looks kind of like the right kind of shape nowhere near as bad as it was although one one of these channels there is oh god yeah there's this there's this horrible there's this horrible glitch in the sine wave but it's only on one of the channels it's not on both of them that's really interesting so let's just have a look at that for a second and change. So yeah, that seems to get worse the more filter I apply. 
but it's only on one of these front channels and not on the other one. That's really interesting. So in order to access any of the settings for the subwoofer RCA output, it seems that we have to go into bass boost and then sub. So this is a bass boost option whereby you can set a boost to the front or rear channels at different frequencies. So here you can see that it's gonna boost under 54, everything under 68, 86, 108, etc and then the amount of boost that you want. If we click on the sub, you can see here we get this graph. It would be good if this was a kind of crossover style thing where we can say, okay, we only want the subwoofer RC output to play under about here, sort of 60, 65 Hertz. And this is the level of the RC output that we want. So let's have a look and actually probe the RC output. Okay, so I'm now playing a 60 Hertz test tone and I'm probing the RC output of the subwoofer on this head unit. So Sometimes the crossover point for the subwoofer RC output is affected by the high pass that you set for the front channels. Um, however, that doesn't seem to be the case here. There's no change to that sine wave when I increase or decrease the high pass, low pass filters on this crossover setting. In order to get to the sub, I think it's going to be in this bass boost thing because as I increase or decrease the level here, you can see the sine wave changes amplitude there for the subwoofer output. And as I change this frequency, you can see that the level also changes on there as we go down below 60 hertz we see less of an output on the scope screen as we go above 60 hertz we see more of an output on the scope screen so i suspect that this is likely actually the subwoofer crossover settings just weirdly hidden in the bass boost settings which is a bit strange so if I maximize this output and load it all the way up to 250, let's start increasing the frequency on here and see whether it actually starts to drop off after 250. So we've got 60 right now. Okay, it actually starts rolling off here at about 120. Um, and by the time we're up at 230, we have lost quite a little bit of output. Let's go higher. So yeah, this definitely is the subwoofer crossover settings and level settings rather than anything to do with bass boost per se. Really strange place to put it. It's a shame that there's no time correction for the subwoofer channel. Um, given the sub is usually quite far away from you in the boot, it'd be good to have some adjustment. Although you can compensate for that by adding some delay to the rest of the speakers to bring the sub back in line with them if there is a delay to the sub. But also due to the phase differences between the sub output and the door speakers output, it would be nice to actually have a separate dial for the sub but you can get around that by simply increasing all of the others or decreasing all of the others to compensate therefore giving you some control over the sub by simply shifting the rest of them up and down reference to the sub and i'm sure some of you are interested to know what the maximum rca voltage is of that sub rca output so let's see we currently are at um one volt rms let's increase that a bit more it actually needs a lot of signal. The sub output is quite weak in comparison to the um, main main output. So as you can see here, this is the sub output. If I turn on the output to the main channel, which is this channel two, you can see here that the output of the amplifier inside actually starts clipping before we get anywhere near the clip point for the RCA output, which I suppose is a good thing, but it does mean that we leave some RCA signal on the table that we're not really able to use because we wouldn't want to be clipping the main channels. But out of pure interest, the clip point for the sub channel is all the way up at a six volt peak to peak RCA output with a 2.1 volt RMS wave. So with time correction off, that's how much of a phase difference there is between the front, rears, and the sub RCA output. Not gonna be a huge problem for anyone really because you can usually adjust the phase on the sub amp and the phase will be different anyway because it's so far away from you in the back and the sub reaction time and all that jazz. But it is interesting to know that yeah, they're not in phase between the sub RCA and the actual output from the amplifier. So we've done some tests with the oscilloscope, looked at the waveforms, but now how does this actually sound? It's very difficult to convey this over YouTube, but there's a few ideas I've had to try and convey what this is doing to the sound, if anything. Firstly, I'm just gonna plug some speakers in and have a listen, tell you my thoughts. 
I probably won't bother setting up my RTA mics pointed at my speakers for you to listen to because really it depends on the device that you're listening on as to how this sounds and unless I notice a vast difference between say my hi-fi amplifier here and the head unit there isn't going to be much difference conveyed over YouTube anyway. I've just hooked it up to my workshop speakers which are nothing majorly special but they sound pretty nice. There's some Tannoys, can't remember the exact model number. I have actually been playing with this before like I said and I have downloaded Cobuzz which is an app that I like to use with my Martin Logans and in the Proton because it is lossless. That obviously won't matter here, but let's just see how well this app works. So, going to go to Micro Buzz, going to go to Favorites, and let's just choose a random track here to play. Naturally, I can't show you too long of each track because I'll get demonetized on this, but... sound wise it's absolutely fine it's plenty loud enough just on these bookshelves the image is quite focused and sharp here the channel separation is good not getting any weird artifacting or anything like that and the time correction is working as intended That sounds perfectly fine. There's nothing that immediately makes me go, oh, this is horrendous. The image is fine, no weird artifacts. Yeah, it doesn't go super loud, but we knew that already. This is a very weak amplifier. But now let's do the interesting test. Let's take a lossless track and let's run it through this and re record it after it's been through the preamp and amplifier stage of this head unit and compare it to the original file. So I've got some flax and some WAVs and I'm going to be recording them to my micro BR in WAV format um, and obviously because this is line level I'm having to go out via the line level converter so what will be recorded will be the coloration by the head unit, the amplifier stage obviously because it's coming out speaker wise and then any coloration that the line level converter is doing and that's because this is how a Toto are expecting you to run this if you're wanting to wire to an external amplifier or something like that. So this will give you an impression of how different it will sound versus the original file or versus using a high quality DAC which I'll record again in a moment. So now I've got a recording of the amplifier's output from this. I thought it was a good opportunity to show you a trick that I had in mind and that does kind of work to get RCA outputs from this that are high quality, that don't use, I don't think, we'll, we'll find out, <laughs> the internal DAC or any of the internal stuff in this um, to actually generate an, an analog sine wave. So because this is a Android system, Android you can plug USB devices into and you're not really limited to what you can plug in, it's kind of like a computer. So here I have a topping D10S DAC. Pretty cool, but not the most amazing thing in the world, but it's pretty nice. You can actually plug this in via USB to either of the USBs on this head unit. Now at first I was hoping that the DAC would be recognized by the system in a way that all of the audio that the system makes would be output via the DAC, which is the way that it works on most mobile phones and such. However, unfortunately that's not the case. Most of these systems audio um, from the default apps and basically anything that works on here is hard rooted through the kind of amplifier stage, even the volume selector on here. The, this volume selector doesn't actually change the Android volume, the system volume. It changes the volume of the amplifier stage in the head unit. The Android volume is fixed at maximum. So you can't actually change the Android volume and you can't change um, what the audio is routed through via Android. However, there is a way around this. There is an app which is a paid app but it is fantastic called USB Audio Player Pro. And this is actually used uh, to bypass some of the limitations of Android in terms of its bit rate via USB to an external DAC and as you can see by opening up USB Player Pro it actually now gives a display on my topping D10 as 44.1 so I'm going to go ahead and play those tracks again USB storage here we go so here's all the tracks that I just played via the head units a built-in media player so I'm now going to play them through USB Player Pro via the topping D10 I'm going to record the output from the topping D10 into my recorder as well have again and see if there's any differences between the output from the amplifier stage versus the output from my topping D10 with the head unit. 
Uh, sadly, it seems that the RCA output voltage from the D10 is so high that it actually maxes out my uh, recorder here. Like you can see here, the over is, is flashing and that means that it's basically clipping the input. I think for now I'm just going to have to deal with it and compare only the parts that aren't uh, clipped here. So let's go back to the beginning and have to put a sensitivity right down to minus six. Or well, hopefully I've got something there that I can kind of compare with, even if it's like only five seconds of unclipped bit, just to kind of see whether there's a huge difference between the recorded output from here versus what it would be through a high, high quality DAC. And the reason that I'm using this rather than going into my PC, for example, is because this is battery powered and completely standalone. Therefore, it doesn't have a switching power supply it doesn't have any noisy components noisy circuits around it like on a motherboard would do um, so this is really the kind of best solution for getting a clean as possible recording with no interference and no external factors right so this is the recorded file from the micro br recorder so this is the original track and i'm then going to solo the recorded one see if you can hear any differences This one may be slightly louder, so I'm just going to decrease the gain by like minus one dB. Gives the impression it sounds better. I can't really notice any discernible difference between these two like uh, I think I can hear like a slight mid-range boost on the recorded one through the head unit but then when I go back to the other one again after a bit it's not there so there's not enough of a difference for me to really say oh wow there's like this sounds like crap or it's not distorting or modifying the sound in in any meaningful way that you'd be able to notice without a being them doing this and really 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 listening for it i mean if we zoom right in on the waveforms here let's like go to these waveforms here for example and let's line these up perfectly here like this bit here and this bit here like it's not coloring or changing the waveform in any meaningful way. And that is through the amplifier and then the voltage step down converters, the line level converters. So you know what? That's actually, actually fine. Um, in a vehicle environment, that would sound perfectly fine. Let's just try the next couple of tracks and see. Again, it sounds absolutely fine, like this. Through these speakers, at least anyway, I can't really hear any obvious differences. If you're listening on headphones, you might, but you know, you're not listening on headphones in a car, so. Yeah, honestly, that's done a really good job. And I think the last track is going to be the same. So I don't think I need to bother with that one. And because that's so close to my ears, at least, um, I don't think I'm going to really notice any difference between that and the recording out of the D10S. I mean, it was clipped, unfortunately. So that's kind of probably going to probably going to ruin a lot of it. But if I just try and uh, match up this here and see if we can hear any difference between the D10S output. Oh, you know what? I'm not even comparing the original file. I'm comparing the output from the uh, head unit to the uh, to the output of the um, D10S. Can you hear any differences? Possible.
Actually, you know what? I think that the output from the head unit is a little bit brighter. And that might be because, as we saw earlier when we were doing the scope, there was a slight bump in output on the higher frequencies as we went up the range. I think we got about a VOS, a volt difference, which on the RCA line will equate to very little. But yeah, I think this has just proven that the output from the head unit's amplifier stage, even through the line level converters, is absolutely fine and unless you are specifically looking for issues with like an extremely high-end perfectly positioned setup that you are unlikely to achieve in a vehicle anyway unless you're peter steinbecker um you're probably not likely to really hear anything different to what the original file would be or or any other more expensive equipment so I was honestly expecting this head unit to color or change the sound signature in some obvious way, especially through the amplifier stage and especially through the line level converters. Um, then we'd be able to see it on Audacity and we'd be able to instantly hear it when we AB between the two. But at least through these speakers, like I said, I haven't tried it on extremely high end headphones or anything like that. Really can't tell a difference. And I'm not gonna bother doing that because when you're in a vehicle, you're not listening on high end headphones. You're not listening in the perfect sitting room with like the best acoustic layout and like the perfect positioning from each speaker and you're not listening to the best speakers in the world either you're listening to car audio speakers which are far from that so from a purely audio quality perspective whether you use this through the built-in amplifier up to a specific volume level that this can provide like 15 watts rms or whether you use the supplied line level converters into a nice amplifier you're going to end up with a good experience as far as sound quality goes can't really see anything wrong there as far as listening in your vehicle goes and if you were concerned about the quality of using this with these or whatever you can use an external DAC like I've done here with the topping D10 and that does work although you are limited to that USB player pro for getting your media output through there. 